Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me tonight to Romans 13. And hold your place at Romans 13. We're also going to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Romans chapter 13. I'm going to preach you a message tonight, Lord willing. It's, it's called Christian Rights. Christian Rights. And it's something that's um, Lord's laid on my heart for a while now. And it's something that's a pretty popular um, subject today. It's talking about people's rights. And uh, let's go to Romans 13. Let's see if I'm on here. Okay, look at, um, look at Romans 13, chapter 11. Now, this is the chapter great chapter on authority and it says in that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep for now our salvation near or is our salvation nearer than when we believed the night is far spent the day is at hand that's the day of Christ let us therefore cast off the works of darkness let us put on the, the armor of light he talks about that in Ephesians 6 let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering, notice this, and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ to make no provision for the flesh, to fulfill the lusts thereof. Now turn with me, if you will, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Look at verse 1. It says, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that ye... As ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye know the commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and in honor, not in lust of concupiscence, even as Gentiles which know not God. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia, but we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more, and that ye study to be quiet, to do your own business, and to work with your own hands, as we command you, that ye may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that ye may have lack of nothing. Brother Paul Howe, would you open us up in prayer, please, brother? Amen. Thank you, brother. You may be seated. <clears throat> now, Paul, obviously, he's writing here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and this is the great chapter on the rapture of the church. You read in 1 uh, Romans chapter 13, the day of Christ is at hand. That's the rapture of the church. We've been talking awful lot about that as of late, have we not? That's a, that's a subject that's come, on, come up an awfully uh, a lot as of late. But I want you to look at here. Paul gives you some practical application for the Christian for what is going to take place, what he expects for the Christian to, to do right before the rapture takes place. So he says this in Hebrews 12, if you believe Paul wrote Hebrews, which I do. It says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin, which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is before us. Notice this, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Can I say this, is that 
What you set your affections in, and your eyes on are going to determine your direction and eventually your destination. What you read in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 is the rapture of the church, the day of Christ, and we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ someday. So that means Paul is trying to lay down some warnings and some practical application here so that you need to understand what you need to be doing before you get up there to the judgment seat of Christ. And all your everything that you did in the body, whether good or bad, is, is naked and open before everybody to see. And that's one of the things the church today is lacking is some practical application and just some, some good, honest things that Paul says here that we ought to be doing. It sets your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. Now, we have a flip side of this, don't we? We have a church in Revelation chapter 3. Everybody knows it. It's called the Laodicean church. Amen? That's the last church you see in Revelation chapter 3, right before the, the rapture in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. All right, everybody's talked about it. We understand that that thing means rights to the people. You have a compound of two Greek words, laos, people, dike, which means rights. Dikios is righteous, and dikiosunes is, or dikiosune is righteousness. So you have a compound of rights of the people. Now that's what everybody today is concerned about, is rights of the people, rights of the people, rights of the people. But what they're not concerned about is what the book says. See, the authority of the Word of God has never went away. It's never stopped. It's never going to stop. But for some reason, Christians think that they can get around the things it says in the book that Paul, your apostle, laid down for you in these epistles that he wrote. 1 Thessalonians is probably one of the first epistles that was written by the Apostle Paul. It was written to new believers, and it was written to, to give them some practical things. Yes, we oftentimes go to 1 Thessalonians 4 because why? It's the rapture. But look what he has before that. All right, so what we see is a contrast between Hebrews 12. You see a church in Hebrews 12, number one, it's not blind, it's looking. He said, looking unto Jesus, the author and finish, finish of our faith. He says, seeing your compass about with so great a cloud of witnesses. There's a whole bunch of folks up there in the grandstands. The Olympics just got finished, right? So you've got a whole bunch of folks up there in the grandstands are watching you and they're waiting for you to come up there with them and they're hoping that you finish the race right. Amen. Those saints that went on before us, they're up there watching you and say, come on, man, just finish right. Finish right. You're almost there. You're almost there. Now it's up to us to finish right, right? But then you see this, you see this church over here. So we see, I'm sorry, for Hebrews 12. So you see that church, it's running a race. It's looking up. It's looking to be clothed upon. Right, But then you see that Laodicean church, it's out of the race, it's looking down, it's looking at all the earthly things. It says, I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Yeah. The only thing it looks at is materialistic nonsense. Right. Amen? And then you see it's a naked church. You've got a naked society in front of you. Right. Amen? Amen? So that's what you see. You see a contrast between Hebrews 12, all right? You've got a church that's still in the race, and you've got a contrast between that Laodicean church who's given up, who's lukewarm, who could care less what the Word of God says. And they're blind. They're spiritually blinded. Why is that? Because they say that they have no sin. They deceive themselves. Right? Second Thessalonians, or Second Timothy 3.13 says, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. What? Deceiving and being deceived. How are they deceiving themselves by saying they have no sin? You know one of the hallmarks in Second Thessalonians, or Second Timothy 3, about the church? It says it's unholy. You know what makes you unholy? If you don't judge sin... What makes God holy? The fact that he's holy and righteous is because he judges sin. If you don't judge sin in your own life, then you're not going to be holy. You're going to be unholy. You're going to be walking around blind. You're going to be out of fellowship with Jesus Christ. And you're going to be walking around groping in the dark, not knowing which way to go and where to go. Amen. So Paul gives you some things here. And he says this. Um, he says this in, in 2 Corinthians 5. He says this. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that, being clothed, we shall not be found naked. That church in Laodicea is naked. Why? It doesn't have any righteousness. It doesn't have the righteousness, the fine linen of the saints. It doesn't have that. Why? She's down there sinning. She could care less. She's lukewarm. And that's the age in which we live right now. Amen. Amen. Now, I don't have to sit here and preach to the choir literally, but you understand where you live. But there's some things that Satan wants to put in front of you, some stumbling blocks that he wants to put in front of you, because why? He wants to get you out of the race. He doesn't want you to finish right. He wants you to be falling out of church. He wants you to be back out in the world. He wants you to have no testimony and to have no power with the world. Now look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Let's look at some rights, some Christian rights. Notice what it says in 4.3. Well, 4.3. 
four one he says how you ought to walk. Look at four two. For you know what suggestions. What's he say? Commandments. Commandments. Now, remember once again Romans thirteen, that great chapter on authority. He says this: For we know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God. You only have to pray for it. You don't even have to ask God, what's the will of God for me in my life? Here it is right here. Even to your sanctification, that you should what? Abstain from fornication. Now what's fornication? You know what that is. He, he, he told you over in Romans 13, it's, it's a Bible word, it's called chambering. What's that? Shacking up. That's what that is. You know what's rampant in the churches today? Shacking up. Now... Listen, I, I, I don't really, it doesn't matter to me which side of the aisle you fall on as far as what you think about the COVID-19 vaccine, okay? I'm just going to give you a little anecdote. Something I heard, there was a, there was a, there was a man who was, he was worried about taking that shot. Whether he did or not, it doesn't matter to me. But what, what I noticed about it was he was so worried about it, he was wanting to get a letter from a pastor so that he could take that to work so he wouldn't have to take that shot. Okay, fine, do whatever you want to do. But the thing about the guy was, he had been shacking up for his, with his girlfriend for 20 years. Had four kids together. Th that didn't bother him. I mean, black and white, right there in front of your face, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you yeah. abstain from fornication. But you're going to come up with some other ex extra biblical stuff that you have in your mind about that thing I could care less about. But what's it say right there in black and white? You know what? He was allowed to stay in the church. Let's, throw, let's go to 1, Thess or 1 Corinthians 5 real fast. Let me show you this. First Thessalonians 5.11. We'll go back to, not Thessalonians, Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 5.11. I'll go back to Corinthians. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a what? Be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or, railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? You mean you judge things? You better judge things that are within. But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that what? Wicked person. You know the first time that word wicked shows up is in, is in Genesis 13. It has to do with Sodom and Gomorrah. It says, put away from among you that wicked person. When I brought this passage up, you know what I was told? Well, if you ever lead a church someday, you'll be preaching to about five people. That's what I was told by a preacher. Yeah. Now, that's the state of the church that we're in. Yeah. Black and white, King James Bible, right in front of you. And that's what I was told from a preacher. Well, if you judge things according to this book, you're going to be preaching to five people. Well, let me just give you some, some things here from the Word of God that might help you. What's, what's, why is fornication such a big deal? Well, it's one of the wiles of the devil. You remember in Ephesians chapter 6, he talks about the wiles of the devil? That's the tactics. That's how he goes about to do things. All right, that's what he does to try to stop the church, and in, in this case, in the Old Testament. Now, go back to Numbers 25, if you will, Numbers 25. Now, that, what I just told you ought to shock you that that came from a preacher's mouth. King James, Bible believing, yeah, whatever. Listen, you can claim you believe the Bible. It only matters how much you apply. I don't care how much you say you believe the book. If you don't apply it, it doesn't mean anything. You might as well be carrying an NIV under your arms for all I care. Amen? Now, look at Numbers 25. You'll see this thing here. It's Baal Peor. This is when ba Balaam gets Balak to cast a stumbling, stumbling block before the children of Israel because he couldn't curse them. But you know, you know what he knew? He knew that God would curse them himself. He would destroy them if they went ahead and committed fornication. So he gets them here. He, he, he calls them to this festival, and he throws out these stumbling blocks before them, and these Midianitish women, and the children of Israel, the men, they go ahead and they start fornicating in the camp with these women. Now look at Numbers 25, 18. For they vex you with their wiles, wherewith they have beguiled you in the matter of Peor, in the matter of Cosby, the daughter of a prince of Midian, their sister, which was, in, which was slain in the day of the plague for Peor's sake. Now, 
If you back up in the story, we're not going to take time to read all of it, but you'll know there, notice a man his, by the name of Phineas. He's the son of Eleazar, the son of the priest. All right? And what he does is he runs a javelin through those two committing fornication in the camp. You know what the Bible says about Phineas? In you know, Psalm 106, verse 31, it says he was, he was imputed righteousness because of that action, because he was zealous for the Lord. He ran him through, and God said, that's my man. Now, that's Old Testament. Yes, it is. But there was imputed righteousness in the Old Testament. Why? He judged sin. That's what, that's what, holiness, that's what holiness will cause. Amen. It'll cause you to judge sin. It'll cause you to judge sin in your own life. And if you don't judge sin in your own life, you're not going to have any power. The children of Israel had no power. Why? Because Satan knew what to do. He just, guess what? He threw that little stumbling block out in front of them, said, here you go. They'll fornicate. Why? Because they just came up out of the land of Egypt. They're just freshly born as a nation, and he knew that they were babes. And he knew that the way to get the babes is just put some fleshly desires in front of their face. You know what Satan's desiring to do today to the church? That exact thing. That's why it's taking place in the church. That's why everybody today, why? Because their conscience is so seared that they don't even care anymore about what the book says. The Holy Ghost has stopped dealing with them. And guess what? They, don't, they, they can care less. They condone everything that comes through those doors and everything that happens within the church. Nobody says nothing. Amen. And that's the state of the church today. That's Laodicea. She's lukewarm. Amen. And they, they, they try to hype it up and they try to, try to entertain you with every other thing under the sun, but they don't care what that book says. All right, here's another one. Go to uh, uh, Joshua chapter 9. You'll, you'll notice again, look at Joshua chapter 9. Next time that word shows up, we'll see it over here in Joshua 9. Look at verse 3. Now this is after children of Israel cross over Jordan. They come in here. They've already destroyed Jericho. They had their problems over here at Ai. But here's Joshua again, and here's, here's some men. Look at uh, Joshua 9, 3. And when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done unto Jericho and to Ai, they did work, notice this, wilily, and went and made as if they were ambassadors, and took old sacks upon their asses and wine bottles, old rent, and bound them. Now what takes place here, Joshua makes a covenant with these people. God told him, don't make a covenant with the people of the land. Joshua did it. Why? Because he was young. He made a mistake, like a lot of us do, right? But what that mistake cost him, you don't see it necessarily show up here, but I'll, show, I'll tell you where you see it show up later on down the road in Judges. Judges 19, you got some men, all right? Now, this is Gibeon. you got some men from Gibeah. Those, both those areas are in the, where Je, or Benjamin resides. They're about 17 miles apart. And you'll see those men from Gibeah, all right? And there's a horrible thing that happens with, with the Levite and his, his concubine. But they want to come in and they want to know that Levite, just like in Genesis 19 what the Sodomites wanted to do to those angels. Amen? Amen? And so what happens is he gives his concubine to those, to those Sodomites out there in Gibeah, and they have their way and so on and so forth. And he winds up killing that, or she dies at the doorstep. He cuts her up, sends her to all 12 tribes of Israel, and what you have is you have the rest of Israel that comes down that's going to fight. They're, they want those men's heads. But you know who's standing there with them? The Benjamites. Because why? They refused to get them out. They refused to conquer them. And what happened was those Benjamites, they've been rubbing elbows for so long. Evil communication corrupts good manners. They've been rubbing elbows so long with those Gibeonites and those Canaanites. But guess what? Not only are they condoning the sin, now they're fighting for it. You notice that in the church today? You notice how many so-called Christians are fighting for sodomites and their rights? You know what his tactic is, what his wile is? He infiltrates. He infiltrates the church. And he stops her from having any sort of power with the world. So you think fornication is a big deal? You better believe it's a big deal. Simple, right? He gives you some simple instructions, 1 Thessalonians, abstain from fornication. So number one, be right with God. That's, that's real simple. There's your Christian rights, right with God. I want you to notice something else in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So after he tells them to abstain from fornication, 
He said that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lust and concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that, that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you, it, it, uh, forewarned you and testified. Now, I want you to take this in New Testament context. You remember Corinth? We just talked about it, right? What was the problem that they were having in Corinth? You can turn back there, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, if you'd like. We had a man that was fornicating. He was taking his father's wife, right? And what was that church doing, or what were they not doing? They were not judging that sin. They were puffed up. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth, right? So you had a church that was heady and high-minded. She was full of knowledge, yet their sin was happening right under her nose. You know what they weren't doing? They weren't judging it. Right. So what did Paul do? He said... He said he gave them over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. You say, that's harsh. No, that's Bible. That's Christianity, folks. See, here's a, here's a, here's a line of delineation. You say, well, okay, uh, I'm not even going to ask you to raise your hand and say, how many in here are saved? Okay, probably everybody in here, most folks are saved. Okay, how about this? How many of you want to be a Christian? There's a difference, folks. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. Amen. He just talked about that this morning. A disciple and a, and a saved person, that's two different things. Salvation's a free gift. Discipleship will cost you something. Those are two different things. When I decided to be, to be a Christian was a whole lot different than me getting saved. I got separated unto God, and then I got separated from things. I said, okay, he's on the throne, I'm on the cross. You're going to have to crucify some things Amen. If you want to be a Christian. So what you have here, you have this man here. He said, give him over to Satan for the destruction of flesh. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Notice how this thing correlates. You have brother going against brother, suing each other, defrauding one another. Now, how did it start? Well, a little leaven leavened with the whole lump. It starts small. Start with that fornication. Then what you have next, you have brother against brother. You know what you had back there in Israel? You had civil war. You had brother against brother fighting each other. And how did it start? Back over there, fornication. Started, started small, ends big. So the whole time that the church should be out there witnessing, passing out tracts, gospel tracts, and preaching on the street, all the, what are they doing? They're suing each other. Paul said, you're better off defra being defrauded by your brother than going before a lost man, before a lost judge, and taking that bad testimony up before them. Amen. And that's what took place at Corinth. So you can see the thing here play out in the Bible. And he says this, and he said that you defraud not one another. So Paul gives you some pretty plain instructions before the rapture. Be right with God. Number two, be right with the brethren. That's simple, right? So he said to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So what you see in the first part of 1 Thessalonians, what you saw in Corinth was a carnal church. They're babes. They never got off the milk. They could, be, they could not discern between good and evil. And with that came envy, strife, and division. Look at James chapter 3 with me real fast, if you will. Look at James says. James chapter 3. Look at verse 13. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show... Out of a good conversation is works with meekness and wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is what? Earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. That's right. What'd you have in Corinth? Confusion. Why? Because you had envy, strife, and division. And who's the originator of that? Well, God's not the author of confusion. So you know who got in there? Satan did to a bunch of babes in Christ who didn't know any better. A, a bunch of little babies that never learned to walk before they learned to talk. Amen? So that's a thing. If you ever notice in nature, you'll notice little babies, they, they learn how to walk before they learn how to talk. But a lot of times, we want to flip that thing on our head. We want to get a bunch of head knowledge. We want to talk before we learn how to walk. Is that not the truth? Yeah. You better believe it is. 
And see how Satan, he'll, he'll deceive you. He said, not a novice, lest to be lifted up with pride, fall into condemnation of the devil. Because yeah. you cannot discern between good and evil without the meat. Amen. And if you're not, if you're unskillful in the word, you're still in the milk. Yeah. Uh, what's that mean? It means you need to sit down and you need to learn from somebody else. Amen? All right, so that's what you have in James chapter 3. So you've got a carnal church over there in Corinth. But then let's look over here once again, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We've got this over here. We've got a spiritually minded. We've got a spiritually minded church. But look at, uh, I want you to just notice verse 8. He therefore, therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his spirit. It's like children despising the chastening of the Lord. That was Corinth. They didn't like hearing it. Right? When Paul came down on them hard, they had a choice to make. Are you going to have godly sorrow or worldly sorrow? That's a choice every one of us has to make when we, when we take that chastening. But he says in verse 9, But as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. So greater, hath, greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. See, he told you to lay, lay aside some things. You're going to have to lay aside some things in Hebrews 12. Right here, you're going to have to lay yourself down so that what? So that somebody else can go up. Laying yourself down is part of the Christian walk. See, it's not about esteeming yourself higher than others. It's about others, you're esteeming others higher than yourself. Notice in John 21, turn with me, Will, to John 21 real quickly. You know the passages. The pastor just went over some of them this morning. Look at uh, John 21, 15. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Now you might have your opinions on it, and, and we all probably do, but I look at the passage and I say, well, who's the these? Well, I say it's those fish he's pointing to that jumped up in that net and laid their life down so that somebody else could live. And he's telling Peter, feed, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. And then very, down there in verse 18, he's telling him how he's going to die. He's going to be crucified. He's going to be carried by other men when he, at the end of his life. And he's saying, Peter, it's no longer about you. It's about those sheep. It's about laying your life down for somebody else. Walk in love. That's easy to preach, hard to live, isn't it? See, when you want to go up the ladder, but you see another brother that needs help, Sometimes you're going to have to lay yourself down so that somebody else can get up on top of your back and walk over you. Why? So that they can go up. Because maybe God has something for them that you don't understand. And then sometimes it's time to lay your life down for somebody else. And that's one of the hardest things to do as a Christian is to lay yourself down. I want to preach. I want to sing. I want to do this. I want to do that. Yeah, well, guess what? Maybe God doesn't want you to do that. Maybe he wants somebody else to do that. Maybe he's trying to bring somebody else along in the ministry. But oftentimes we want to look at ourselves, don't we? We don't want to lay ourselves down. We don't want to love one another as we ought to. That's how you're going to be known as one of his disciples if you love one another, is it not? Amen. Amen. It's awfully quiet. Back at 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 10, And indeed ye, ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia, but we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. He said, He must increase, but I must decrease. Notice John the Baptist, he said, He must increase first, then I must decrease. You've got to pour in Jesus Christ. You've got to pour that meal in because there's death in the pot. And the more meal that you put in that pot, the more that thing gets dispersed and gets delineated and the less of you is in that pot because the only thing that you have in you is death. Amen. That's the only thing that comes out of your carnal mouth. Amen. Is death. Amen. But when Jesus Christ comes in, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Amen. He must increase, but I must decrease. And that's notice this, and that's you study to be quiet and to do your own business and work with your own hands as we commanded you. Now this right here, boy, this is a, this is a flip of today. Notice he says, study to be quiet. I just talked about you've got to learn to walk before you talk. 
But nowadays, especially with social media, everybody's got a platform, don't they? And know this, that everything that you say or do will be held against you in a court of law. You have a right to remain silent. We used to be trained to, teach, to say that to a criminal if we arrested them, right? Amen. Some of you former, some of you former and current you know, law enforcement officers know that thing well. You have a right to remain silent. Because there's coming a day in the judgment seat of Christ where everything's going to be drug out and everything that you say is going to be held against you. Here's one, here's one of the things. When I was called to preach, it, the most nerve-wracking thing to me was not public speaking. No, it wasn't that. It was the fact that I have to handle this book and that I am held accountable for everything that I say from this pulpit I'm held accountable for. Yeah, Amen? Now that's a heavy burden to carry. Every time, every time I get up here to teach, you better be sure that I better be doctrinally sound. I better be straight with the book and straight with the Lord because I'm giving you something in a position of authority behind this pulpit. So you better believe it means something when you get up here behind this pulpit. Now, here's the thing. When you get on social media and you put something on there from the book of Second Opinions because you think you're called to preach, guess what? You're going to be held accountable for that. Right. My wife showed me something just a little while ago, a couple days ago, whatever it was. We got this, th this guy now. I, I guess he, he's a country music star. and he's, He got on Tucker Carlson. Some of you probably know about it. And he's up there talking, oh, the church is going th uh, through the tribulation. Yeah. And everybody's listening to that stuff. And he's, he's up there and he's spouting off all kind of Id idiocy. And I'm, I'm listening to this thing go on. Here's the problem though. He said, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Well, there's a whole lot of ignorance out there for people to even listen to that. Listen, folks, the doctrine doesn't change just because things are taking place in America. All right? Does not mean the church is going through the tribulation. He said, we're not appointed under wrath but to obtain salvation. Right. Is that not what he says? 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. But yet people are listening to people on YouTube because they never learned to study to be quiet. Romans 12, he said, those that minister, let them wait on their ministering, those that teach on their teaching. He says, wait. Sit, wait, study to be quiet. It's going to take some time for God to be able to use you. So not everybody that's, is called to preach. I'm not saying, now we talked about it this morning. Yes, you're called to preach and witness where you're at. But I'm talking about from an official capacity. God uses men who he calls and who he equips from his book and the authority of scripture. So you better be careful about things that you put on social media. Why? Because the lost world is looking and watching everything that you do. And when you put things out there that are a little bit, we'll just say kind of out there, they're looking at you going, look at that bunch of kooks over there, man. Next time you try to witness to them about the Lord Jesus Christ, you know what they're going to say? You're a kook. So you better be careful about things that you say and post on social media. Amen? He says this, do your own business. That means not busybodies in other men's matters. Once again, social media, that is about the death knell of the church nowadays. That causes more problems than anything that you could even imagine is social media. Amen? And what they see on there also is they see a bunch of Christians fighting with each other. Now, what do you think that looks like to the lost community? Amen. It's not a good testimony. I, I know it's getting quiet. Amen. I know I'm stepping on some toes here, but listen, you're held accountable for that stuff. Amen? Amen? He says this, so uh, do your own business and work with your own hands. He said, if any would not work, neither should he eat. I mean, am I in this King James Bible, right? Second Thessalonians chapter 3. He said, hey, you're not even to keep company with people that don't. Nowadays, what you got is a bunch of busybodies and other men's matters working not at all because that's pushed out our throats in society now. Listen, it's good to work with your hands. It's good to be able to feed yourself. It's a good example to set to the lost world looking around you because th here's the thing. The final point is right with the brethren, right with the world because here's the two things the world's going to watch you with. Your work habits and how you handle money. They're watching everything that you do. Your work habits and how you handle money. So those are the things right here that Paul gives you some simple instruction how to be right at the rapture. Right with God, right with, right with the brethren, 
right with the world. Now, I know I just kind of gave you a lot there. And so there's a lot of faces looking at me. It's a little quiet. <laughs> but uh, I love you. I do. I, but because I love you, you know, I'm going to tell you the truth. And uh, because I tr tell you the truth, am I now your enemy? And a lot of times that's the case. People don't like that kind of, you know, preaching from the book like that. Because, why? well, because we're not talking about big events. We're talking about sin. We're talking about things that are right in your backyard, right in your kitchen. See, when, when the Lord Jesus Christ shows up in your kitchen and he starts reading your mail, it gets awfully quiet. And that's a good thing. Because why? We all need it. I know I need it. Because I've got sin. And if I don't confess that sin, I'm not going to stay in fellowship very long, and I will not be able to be up here behind this pulpit and give you anything worthwhile. Amen? Amen? All right. We'll finish there. Thank you for listening. And I just thank the Lord for uh, showing up tonight. Father, we just thank you. Thank you for liberty. Thank you for getting me through the message. And I pray that it uh, would go out and accomplish that which you please. And I know it will. And Father, I just, I just pray that we can stay on the straight and narrow, Lord, and we just finish the race right. Lord Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.